oil fields, whatever their surroundings, have one thing in common. Their drill holes find bottom in the bed of some ancient sea. In the days of the first great oil boom, around 1900, the drill holes were very shallow, and so was our understanding of oil and how it came to be there. What mattered in those days was that people were finding it and selling it. The more they found, the more the world wanted, and many a prospector made a fortune knowing nothing of geology. As the boom went on, the oil search spread around the world, and oil men often found themselves working close to the sea. Appraisal of these coastal fields showed that the oil formations continued offshore, at least beyond the tidal shallows. So began our interest in the sea. In the 1920s, oil was being found in the swamps of Louisiana, and the only way of reaching it was by barge. The wells were drilled from platforms set on piles with walkways to the nearest patch of dry land. 1930 saw the first rig mounted on its own barge. The oil search was afloat, but only in sheltered inland waters. In Borneo, too, there was oil underwater, but no shelter. The walkways lengthened. The platform piles were driven deeper, but in the early 50s, Operations were still firmly tied to the land, and we scarcely got our feet wet. On the other side of the world, oil was being drawn from below Lake Maracaibo, a huge inlet of the sea. But it was known that there were other great sedimentary basins lying under other open seas. The implication was obvious. It was time to cast off from the land. Sailing the high seas is routine nowadays, after thousands of years of practice. But for us, the experience would be novel, our craft unorthodox. The hazards, great. In a hostile environment, we would have to set structures, machinery, and men. How would they stand up to it? Before we could move, we had to take the true measure of the sea, reduce its random surface to order by accumulating data and statistics on wind speeds, wave heights, tidefall, ocean currents. We had to find ways of predicting their behavior over long periods of time. We had to take our investigations further still, from the surface of the sea to what lies beneath. The aqualung and underwater camera have made us familiar with the seabed around our coasts. Today, these are the playgrounds of the amateur skin diver, the field of the marine biologist. But we must look both beneath and beyond these underwater landscapes, sample all kinds of seabed to test them for load bearing and anchor holding, and to learn the precise nature of the rock layers far below. We must reach beyond the range of divers where the sun's rays never penetrate. To the oil man, even this is merely the surface of the problem. He has still to penetrate it, to drill through millions of years of accumulated sediments down to the hidden sources of petroleum. In 
In some areas, the land itself may still provide a clue, wherever the deep-lying strata thrust upwards to the surface. But a good example is rare. And even if the geologist finds one, all he can really learn is that he's in the right kind of area, that this is the compacted sediment of some ancient seabed. But where does the outcrop lead? Just how do the strata lie far out under the present sea? One way to find out is seismic survey. This boat is following a carefully predetermined course. To do this, it relies on radio navigation. A cable two miles long is paid out. Spaced along it are 24 microphones. These will pick up shock waves of an explosion as they echo back from the rock layers beneath the seabed. The reverberations will be recorded on magnetic tape. Shot point. Charge over. OK, shoot it. OK, shoot it. OK, Skipper, next shot point. In good weather, and with no shows of fish to avoid, in one day, we can record up to 250 tapes. And so, shot by shot, we accumulate a picture of the deep-lying strata. Shot by shot. But in a cryptic form. The problem now is to translate the hieroglyphics into plain language, to turn the jigsaw into a contour map. OK, shoot it. A set of seismic records has been processed to a visual form, a pattern which the seismologist can now read. As his pencil traces how the rock layers run, we see for the first time what the seismic survey reveals. The most exciting shape is a dome, the classic oil trap. Whenever one appears, interest quickens. We have interpreted the sections now of some 3,000 kilometers of seismic lines, and the first conclusion that can be drawn is that the area certainly looks promising. We contoured on three horizons, and in particular horizon C shows a southward plunging trend, and on top of it something which well may be a nicely closed structure. Well, I'm still worried because your whole conclusion hinges on the reliability of this seismic line. An area looks promising, no more than that. Some reveal their secrets quickly. Others have withheld them for years until our probing became refined enough to break their code. A recent and startling example of this was the North Sea. The search was the most intensive ever carried out. Part of it from helicopters, where old minefields made surface work dangerous. Hopes may be high, but no survey, however detailed, can prove the presence of oil. The only way to find out is to drill. And anywhere in the world, this is an expensive business. Tell me, how much does an offshore well in this area cost? I would say something of the order of half a million pounds. Mm-hmm. Well, gentlemen, I think we got here a nice feature, but we are not too certain about the exact location. And I think we should recommend to shoot a few additional seismic lines before we commit ourselves to the heavy expenditure of drilling the well. Do we all agree? Sure. OK. Well, in that case, we better move to the next question and go to Borneo. In Borneo, as you all know, 
We have decided on a location quite a long time ago, and at present preparations are in hand to start drilling. A search over thousands of square miles has been narrowed to a single map reference. Now it must be identified on the featureless surface of the sea. If it's far offshore, it's a job for advanced electronic equipment. But within sight of land, a simpler method can be used, visual triangulation. A job for three men and a boat. Baram tawa panggil Garuda, baram tawa panggil Garuda. Sekarang saya ada flash dengan cermin sabaya. Out at sea is a survey boat, preparing the marker boy which it will drop over the drill site. To find the position, the master depends on surveyors stationed at two widely spaced points along the coast. Together, they will guide him to the spot. Mari tawa panggil Garuda. Sekarang Garuda sudah masuk di dalam saya punya terapung. Tidak lama sampai location. Kos ada bagus, tetapi pergi sedikit sebelah miri, sedikit miri, sedikit. Geroda, pelahan, 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 pelahan. Lakukan sedikit. Steady, steady. Sedia, sedia. Jatuh! Jatuh! To find and mark a promising site has been costly, but nothing to what is now to be spent on drilling. When we talk of risk capital in offshore exploration, this is what we mean. 4,000 miles west of Borneo, off the coast of the Sheikdom of Qatar, stands Seashell. She's essentially a barge that jacks herself up out of the water on eight huge legs. She was specially designed for work in these coral bedded waters. Weighs more than 6,000 tons and cost over two million pounds to build. She's just completing her latest well and will soon be moved to another location. Oh, Rhys, I just heard from Doha they want to prepare for the rig move. Can you let me know when you're ready? All right, we'll get to work immediately. Seashell to Doha, Seashell to Doha. The helicopter is just leaving with eight of the crew aboard. The signal to move will come from Doha, on the mainland, 50 miles away. However urgent the drilling program, the decision to move depends on the weather. Oh, Ian, we've just got the okay to move the seashell. How does the weather? Oh, would you hold on a minute, Alan? I'm just finishing the chart off now. Information comes in from weather stations up and down the Gulf. To move seashell safely, even a couple of miles, means watching the weather over an area the size of Western Europe. Hello, Alan? Yes, Ian? Well, you can expect southeasterly 10 to 12 knots. That's two to three feet for the next 18 hours. There is a cold front moving in across Arabia we'll have to watch, but I don't think it'll go above 15 knots before tomorrow. So it means either move now or face a long wait. Well, that's how it looks at the moment. Thanks, Ian. We'll start right away. Jerry, please let the seashell know that the weather's OK, so there to go ahead. Back on board, the last of the decking is raised clear of the wellhead. The tug is standing by, ready for the tow line. Down in the control room, the platform engineer has made his final check and now switches the eight sets of hydraulics through to the master control. 
Before she can be freed from the seabed, the barge must first be lowered down the legs back into the water. How's it going? Well, we're just down at water level and we made a final check. No, that's fine. Let's carry on, Jackie. Right. I'm going to raise the legs now. the wind is still increasing, but there's no change yet at Bar Inn, so the forecast holds good. We've jacked the legs up about 12 feet, so we should be free of the seabed in 30 minutes. Tug Mississippi, Tug Mississippi, this is a seashell. The legs are just coming free of the seabed now, and she's beginning to move, so it's all yours. The well that seashell leaves behind is a producer. She has proved the presence of oil in a new area of search. Around the world, conditions vary. So do our techniques. Lake Maracaibo is one of the most productive offshore areas. Here we are engaged on intensive oil field development. Atlas, the first crane barge to bring in a complete derrick in one straight lift, can move up to 400 tons of equipment at a time. Drilling is still done from fixed platforms, but now they're of steel in standard sections, mass-produced. Epoxy coatings protect them from the heavy corrosion of these landlocked waters. Surface conditions are relatively easy. The maximum wave height is only eight feet. So drilling supplies and power are provided from tenders anchored alongside. From the swamps and bayous of the Mississippi Delta, the search has moved steadily out into the Gulf of Mexico. With it has gone the submersible barge. As water depths have increased, she has grown. Her platform raised on stilts above the submersible hull. She settles herself by flooding her tanks, one end first, then the other, till she's firmly sitting on the seabed. She was designed for the soft bottom conditions off the delta and can work in up to 70 feet of water. But the need to drill in water twice, three times as deep has produced equipment that is really spectacular. 8,000 tons of steel went into this one, as much as in a fair-sized ocean liner. On tow, it towers over 200 feet above the sea. This rig, too, floods her tanks and sits on the bottom. But the difficulty of lowering and raising such giants imposes a limit on their development. To work in even deeper waters, drilling has had to go afloat. Off Borneo, for instance, 
the water depth in a single area of search may vary from 70 to 250 feet. Here, the floater comes into its own. Sidewinder is a ship anchored over the drill hole and fitted with outrigger pontoons to give added stability. Headed into the prevailing wind, she can drill over the side in 12-foot waves. The introduction of such floaters was a great step forward in deep water drilling. But to operate in really rough seas, one must have a more stable platform. The problem has been to combine the depth capability of the floater with the stability of the bottom supported unit. Out in the Pacific, we have the answer at work. This rig also floats, but it can work in 30-foot waves and 70-mile-an-hour winds. Like an iceberg of steel, the platform supports itself on buoyancy tanks, 40 feet down below the waves where the water is relatively still. Surface waves pass through the frame, leaving the platform almost undisturbed. In the control room, the balance and draft is maintained as drilling continues. Below deck, the waves continue to roll. Their only obvious effect, the gentle swing of the spirit level. This type of semi-submersible platform is a turning point. It brings within our reach the entire continental shelf, 10 million square miles of sea, up to 100 fathoms deep, from the tropics to the Arctic Circle. We've stuck oil off the coast of Alaska. The problem now is how to exploit it. For the men who build and develop this field, it means working in Arctic gales at 40 degrees below zero. The multi-well platform is designed to stand up to earthquakes, to 35-foot waves, and in winter, fast-moving pack ice up to six feet thick. And already it's beginning to grow. Cook Inlet is a reminder that there is no simple formula for offshore operations. Each undertaking has to be matched to its own particular environment, however extreme it may be. The only rule that applies with certainty is that offshore, costs are more than three times those on land. To get from discovery to production means striking a balance between audacity and caution, between experiment and proven techniques. To succeed, you need skills which can function in the dockyards of an industrial city, out at sea, or on a desert shore. Our engineering is worldwide.
as the scale of offshore operations increases. So planning has to keep ahead. Each step into deeper water, each move into a new environment, calls for changes in the pattern of our thinking. Behind each blueprint, each scale model, is the search for new techniques and greater economy. The urge to improve on existing capabilities and to make sure the ideas work. No drilling platform yet devised is perfect. But can we move nearer to the ideal? One of our latest efforts is this stay flow unit. But it still has anchors. And these limit the depth of water in which it can work. Can we find another way of keeping the platform over the hole? We can. And the proof is... Eureka. She's a small vessel designed for core drilling. Already she's worked in 4,000 feet of water, holding her position without anchors by dynamic stationing. The system is controlled by an automatic pilot. It compensates for drift by varying the direction and thrust of swiveling propellers at each end of the ship. Eureka is a breakthrough. And we are now applying the principle on a much larger scale. At present, the ability to discover oil offshore is ahead of the means to produce it. But in production, too, things are on the move. An oil field is an industrial complex. It has to be organized and run to a meticulous routine. In and around an offshore field, the workhorse is a boat, a plane, or a helicopter. And they're far more than just a means of transport. Block 18, this is helicopter 897. I'll be landing in three minutes. OK, but we've had a report of an oil slick at the south platform. We can't find it. I wonder if you check it before you come in. Over. Roger. I'll make a low pass on the way in. These are the men who keep the fields going, regulate the oil flow, maintain the wellheads and production stations. Forgotten now are the giant rigs which once stood here the months of drilling which brought the field into being. The sea has become merely the background to a daily routine. Eight nine seven to block 18. I can find no trace of oil on the surface. Eight nine seven, clear. No trace of oil on the surface. Though down on the seabed of the Gulf of Mexico, lies a web of pipelines leading to the gathering stations where the oil is stored for transshipment ashore. Commander OL1, todavía en contadas con el número 7. ¿Qué podemos hacer? Cambio. Aquí OL1. Favor cerrar las válvulas de seguridad. Salgo inmediatamente para allá. Cambio. In Venezuela, each year sees the crew boats speeding further out from base. On Lake Maracaibo nowadays, men don't just go to work. They commute, maybe 40 miles a shift each way. Of the million barrels a day we produce from the whole Maracaibo basin, close on half is now coming from beneath the lake itself, and we're still drilling. Desde GP10, 
estamos a una profundidad de 10,700 pies. Each well that's brought in adds one more link to the network of pipes that brings the oil ashore to the gathering stations and on to the ocean terminal at Puerto Miranda. Adelante, Puerto Miranda, adelante, Puerto Miranda. Efectuadas las operaciones de cambio, pueden bloquear la línea fría. Empezaremos a bombear por la caliente de inmediato. Inmediatamente. Atención, Vitrea, atención, Vitrea. Aquí operaciones, Puerto Miranda. When it reaches its final point of offtake, offshore oil can be handled like any other. But there is already one place on the other side of the world where its handling is very different. The oil field at Idel el Sharji does away with conventional port facilities. Oil flows from the wellheads to the production platform under natural pressure. Here, the gas is removed, some of it to drive the remote-controlled machinery, the rest flared off out of harm's way. The crude then goes by underwater pipeline a mile and a half beyond the edge of the field to what we call an SBM, a single boy mooring. This not only anchors a storage tanker, but also feeds it the oil through a flexible floating hose. The Zanacia stays here permanently. But once a week, another tanker comes alongside to take off her cargo of crude. Ship-to-ship -ship transfer is possible even in bad weather, and Zanacia herself has stayed on station through the roughest seas. This, we believe, is a development as significant for the future of offshore operations as the first semi-submersible drilling rig and the introduction of dynamic stationing. These achievements are the more striking when one thinks back to their beginnings. When this field first started producing, oil came from the land. The bulk of it still does. But how long will this remain true? Less than 40 years ago, in the swamps of Louisiana, the first halting steps were taken towards offshore production in just six feet of water. Today, we are prepared to drill in a thousand feet. We believe there may be as much oil deep under the sea as has yet been discovered on land. But can we build oil fields out there? and keep them flowing. Our attack on this problem is from two directions. One has already led to this. A mechanical diver, an underwater robot that can swim, hear, see, and work deep on the ocean floor, controlled from the surface by television. Another approach, an attack on the depth barrier by man himself. By experimenting with new breathing mixtures, we aim to overcome the problem of narcosis encountered in deep diving. This involves studying their effect on the blood. But this is not all. The human reaction to an alien environment is many-sided. To be safe, we must investigate them all. Is alles in order? Yeah, well. This is fundamental research, unveiling laws of nature which are as yet only partially understood. So, can we start? I'll give it a look. In the pressure chamber, we simulate the conditions we shall encounter, working at depths far beyond those at which divers work today. And then, we put our findings to the test. The 
underwater search can only be carried to success by mobilizing on a gigantic scale all the resources of science and engineering, of finance, and above all, of the finest qualities of human skill and imagination.